Drug courts are uh, an experiment in justice that began in this country starting in 1989 with the creation of the Miami Drug Treatment Court. Uh, it was thought to be innovative in its approach in that it used a carrot and stick uh, method to try to get defendants to sobriety, focusing not so much on the crime charged, but more on the problem that brought the defendant into the court. Um, the experiment in Miami was also viewed as um, innovative in that it's sort of switched the way that courts approach uh, dealing with crimes. It's not so much an adversarial approach, but uh, deals with uh, the defendant as part of a team, and everyone, the judge, the prosecutor, and the defense lawyer are part of the team that tries to move the defendant uh, from, from addiction to sobriety. In a regular court, a defendant has a trial or pleads guilty and then a sentence is imposed and the judge is usually uh, removed from the, the criminal process at that time. The, the sentencing generally is dealt with by prisons and jails or probation and parole authorities and the defendant would come back before the court if there was an alleged violation of law, an alleged sanction that needed to be visited because of a violation of law. Uh, in these courts, the judge is very closely involved in the treatment of the defendant. Uh, receiving reports from treatment uh, providers, engaging defendant uh, on a biweekly basis sometimes, sometimes a weekly basis, and becoming very personally involved in their lives um, in ways that some people argue is problematic, that they become too paternalistic and the boundaries become blurred between uh, judge as, as the arbiter and the decider and judge as family member or counselor or something, perhaps that they're not really qualified uh, to the role they're not qualified to play. There's a lot of literature out there that has um, supported drug courts that have claimed that the courts are a success in that they uh, curb recidivism, that they save money, that there are fewer defendants going to jail and prison because of the drug courts. Uh, and that was the big hook initially. The Miami court was created as an alternative to incarceration. Uh, in fact, often many defendants are incarcerated at the time of their, um, once they're done participating in drug court. Um, they are, they fail out of the courts and are often sent off to serve prison sentences that might be longer than they would have originally served if they just resolved their case at the beginning. Depends on who you ask. Uh, the proponents of the courts claim that there has been a tremendous savings uh, in creating these courts. But if you look at the data that has been um, offered by, by some who've reviewed the courts, who say that between a third and a half of defendants fail out, if at the end of the day those defendants are going to be serving the same prison sentences as they would have served before or longer, which was my experience in the Bronx Treatment Court in New York, I'm not sure how you can say that there's a cost uh, benefit there because you have half the defendants failing out and saving uh, and serving twice as long as they would have ordinarily served after you've, you've pumped in all of this money for the treatment and support that they've received for months and sometimes years in a drug court. I worked in the Bronx Treatment Court in the 1990s and I was one of the first uh, defense lawyers to then write about that experience. And I think what, what I saw is what we're seeing in a lot of the drug courts, the first generation drug courts, that those who run the courts, the judges who are in charge, are drawn to the work because of their own um, personal desire to help the people who come before the courts. And so you have sort of these enlightened individuals who uh, care about how the courts are run. But once those individuals leave the courts, um, you have less of a control on who it is um, or how it is that the courts are run. And you don't necessarily have that kind of enlightened, both um, wanting to, to protect defendants' rights uh, type people running the court um, and those who are concerned with treatment. And so other that people then start rotating through. And it's not the first generation um, kind of do-gooder judges uh, who are running the courts. Um, we also saw that, unfortunately, often defense lawyers weren't present when uh, hearings were taking place. A big part of the drug treatment court model are these review hearings that I talked about, where um, the court and the stakeholders review the defendant's progress in their programs. But because defense lawyers already had too many cases, we might be in other courtrooms uh, taking care of other clients and not present when our case was called, and might find out after the fact that a client had been sanctioned for something they did in treatment. And everyone sort of thought that that was you know, not so problematic given that the client had agreed to enter into the drug treatment um, teamwork approach model.